don't be shy Because we're about to show you how cars can fly I love that song. In fact, what's really interesting is my composer has moved to Florida. Going to see him tonight, Michael Ruggieri. If you haven't seen the movie EinsteinWrong.com, you got to check it out, man. The music is absolutely phenomenal. He and I are working on a secret project that actually is very, very similar. Um, but no one's going to know that for for about uh, a while. But if you want to check out that uh, song at least, it is great. We have a music video that goes with it. But of course, you've reached Saturday Science Chats. Good morning. Good evening good afternoon depending on where you are in the world yeah i thought it would wear a non-scientific t-shirt today samba yes work no uh yeah i lived in brazil i love samba we uh, have been have a samba group do a lot a lot of fun things Samba is a great art form, both music and dance. And if you haven't been to Rio de Janeiro and, saw, and see the amazing parades in their Samba Drome, you got to go there. Put it on your bucket list. You got to check that out. Um, and of course, today we have our chats and we've got a great uh, show for you, uh, sponsored by, of course, the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society. And of course, Dissident Science. I want to welcome all the subscribers from my Dissident Science chat uh, YouTube channel, as well as almost reaching a thousand our, uh, our CNPS uh, YouTube channel. We're going to be talking to um, uh, Jane uh, Marison today on the local theory, uh, local ether theory available. Uh, uh, a vibe available <laughs> a viable alternative to relativity why don't they put more spaces in that font come on that's that's pretty sucky uh so you don't want to miss that and of course i want to thank everybody yeah i had to change my my uh, uh photo because yeah i've gone natural gray now i can't take it anymore uh but i want to thank everybody who is watching because it is without you guys this wouldn't be here <clears throat> of course and this is the only show in the world like it well, it's the only only uh show in the world that brings on people with alternative ideas who challenge mainstream ideas and do it in a very scientific way not going to find anything else so <clears throat> make sure you like and subscribe and subscribe put that little bell there so when we go live you'll be alerted uh, when we have our next show. So I want to thank everybody out for their support, both also if you're watching this recording, make sure you do hit the like button and, and subscribe. That does help us get the word out there. So um, we are cri where critical thinkers meet. The John Chappelle's uh, named after a uh, doctor. I think he, I can't remember where he's from. Uh, it was something like, I don't think it was Harvard, but it was someplace like that. He uh, uh, was a doctor of philosophy, I believe, but he uh, started the the uh, Natural Philosophy Alliance back in the early 1990s. He passed away in the early 2000s, and we keep his legacy alive. We uh, changed our name in 2015 to the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society in honor of what he uh, started. And of course, we are open for, we're an organization that above all promotes critical thinking without malice. An organization that supports, publishes, and promotes serious work outside mainstream science to provide a forum uh, 
for open debate about modern topics in physics, cosmology, philosophy, and mathematics, and to provide a forum for presenting certain uh, papers and theories without fear of censorship <coughs> to be run in its hour by our membership. And uh, of course, memberships are how we keep going. So uh, who we are, of course, we are open to challenging mainstream ideas, allow and encourage competing ideas or models, uh, which is about every other profession except physics and cosmology, which is very strange. And of course, follow the we do follow the scientific method. People think we just throw everything out. It's not true. Of course, as well, we can, we can consider an idea without accepting it. And that's what I would encourage everybody to do. So if you are not um uh, oh somebody says about a half a foot away oh is that too loud am i too loud folks sorry about that how about this now is that better all right somebody is complaining about the mic all right um <laughs> Anyways, uh, we do give voice to the vo uh, voices to the voices, and we are where mainstream advances. It always, uh, uh, actually, well, science advances doesn't happen inside of mainstream; it happens outside. We are not a specific point of view, so we have many different points of view. We're not a general science organization. We pretty much stick to foundational physics and cosmology. We're not new age, we're not conspiracy or UFO. We've got too many things to worry about, like the foundational science, light, gravity fields, etc., magnetism, tectonic plates. It's all that. And we do have our website. Our, actually, it's not a new website. It's just been rebranded to beyondmainstream.org, our online magazine for critical thinkers. And we have philosophy and naturalphilosophy.org, which, which is our community where you can go and discuss things with people. Uh, if you have ideas about what's going on in the universe, you can do that. And, of course, our Wikipedia uh, we have we have a real Wikipedia, meaning the same software as Wikipedia, but it's called it's the wiki.naturalphilosophy.org, and that is a Wikipedia where we have um, all of our uh, over ten thousand pages of abstracts and books and people and scientists uh, who are working outside the mainstream. Of course, we uh, survive on our monthly uh, memberships and our annual memberships and our donations. We get all of those. So you can go to our, our page and that is, a, oh, I should stupidly, I need to put that from na at naturalphilosophy.org and uh, that's where you can, you pay your membership. And after that, it will just automatically charge you. Uh, some people actually do the monthly membership of five bucks a month. That's easy to do. Um, and that gets you uh, sixty dollars a year. All that helps pay for this couple thousand dollars worth of of things we have to do and pay for on the internet, from server to the software we use that is uh, subscription based, which is everything now, and uh, also our uh, things that uh, we do, such as Streamyard, which is the internet service that you're watching now, which costs us a, a monthly fee. And of course, we also accept any kind of donations. And we do have people do that, uh, donate 50 bucks, 100 bucks, even more than that. So we accept anything, any donation, but the monthly or annual memberships are the things that really obviously keep us going. I want to thank our patrons, uh, Dr. Cynthia Whitney, our Chief uh, uh, Science Officer, and uh, Nick Percival, Duncan Shaw, Anonymous, Bob D. Hilster, Kurt Renshaw, as some of our patrons. Also, we have our CMPS conference coming up, uh, 2021. We are currently accepting papers. And just the what your appetite, I'm writing a paper on why ether data data transmission via via ether is not a is not a, a optimal way to do it. In fact, uh, there's a lot of problems there if you look at that in a data transmission. If you look around you in the world and you see all the amazing information you get from your eyes, um, being able to transmit that through basically particles that stay in the same place, it's really really hard to do. So uh, I'm going to be writing a paper on uh, that problem with Ether. Um, and we have other people. I know Jeff Yee is going to be uh, submitting a paper. And if you have a paper that's already been published or put on the internet and on a um, um, website somewhere, um, I don't know, there's all kinds of places people put them there, hoping that they'll be discovered by mainstream and uh, Oxford will come calling and you become the head of the uh, same place as Newton. Well, who knows? Could happen, but um, uh, but you can uh, publish in our uh, proceedings and we will have our 
uh, we've already launched and we are taking people's um, submissions and we also have the um, uh, we use the overleaf system. I need to put that down there for the papers and allows you to do it. We don't use Word. We use overleaf. It's pretty easy to use. So if you haven't used it before, then um, that's okay. We'll teach you. We have my dad who will help you with that. But that way we can put it all together. And that allows us to get the uh, go until about two weeks before the conference, actually, and, and still have papers uh, in the proceedings and get them out in time. So, um, anyways, we're going to be taking a uh, place in the fall of 220, 2021, Northern Hemisphere fall, that is. And uh, we're going to be doing having presentations that will be recorded presentations for each of the papers so people can watch those ahead of time. And then we'll be having um, Zoom meetings where people can get together like they're in a room and discuss those papers and ask questions. Uh, we uh, had a meeting about that. If you can look, you want to do it, go back and look at look up um, our... Um, YouTube on our YouTube channel, either on the CMPS YouTube channel or the Dissident Science Ch YouTube channel, and uh, we did a session on how we're going to be doing this, and uh, a lot of good ideas came out of that. So that's going on. Of course, we are publishing. Um, Notfinity is ready to publish. I haven't talked with George on that, but um, he's I think he's working on that, getting it out there. Um, ready to publish is uh, R R Ramsey, his book called Ether. That is E T H E R. Even though we like to spell it E A. T E T H E R because ether is actually a gas and um, that's not what people are proposing. So we try to use the E A T H E R uh, spelling normally, but that's why he did it. That's not a big deal. Um, then, of course, we are in a final version um, uh, and uh, people are reviewing, and I'm, we're getting our reviews from uh, over t uh, about 10 people who are viewing, uh, reviewing it. Not in the sense of this book's terrible. What, what, how can anybody say the universe? No, it's not a review or, oh, this is the greatest model ever. No, we're, we're actually having these people read it for clarity, for um, problems in the how we say things, how we communicate things. The good news is, I can tell you some of the good things, um, people really say it's not a boring book at all because there's a lot of graphics in it because our model does not rely on mathematical equations. Uh, you re relies on in intuition. So I actually wrote some programs in um, Adobe um, Illustrator and to, uh, for instance, generate random particles going in directions, sometimes in sa same directions, and they're all drawn differently, which really makes it, which is what we think because no two particles in the universe are alike according to um, Burkert, and we subscribe to that. But anyways, um, uh, people are liking that part of it. There's a lot of great graphics in it. Um, working on actually an index to the graphics because so many people like it, uh, where you go in the back and read it and you think of something, you want to get to a graphics and go to the page. Um, and then we actually have a hack, at least a hack, we think, for diffraction, which came up, yes, I don't even know what day. My dad's uh, online, but I don't remember what day it was. It was either yesterday or the day before. What day, Dad? Oh, I don't hear you. Okay. Um, oh, that's because I have to bring you up. Okay, don't... Uh, my dad, of course, fell down. What What day was that, Dad? Oh, uh, what? Uh, we talked about this diffraction yesterday. Oh, my gosh. I'll bring you down because people are like, yes, my dad's recovering from a fall, and uh, they asked me in the hospital, did... Are they abusing you? <laughs> so, you know, I gave him an answer. Thanks. When he uh, felt they, uh, he was in the hospital, you know, uh, just for precautionary uh, uh, observation, etc. He said, are they abusing you? And I and I, I didn't say this, but I said, um, I think I said it on Facebook. Yeah, my, my, my son's forcing me to write a physics book with him. <laughs> Uh, I thought it was funny. Anyways, I'm sure. Uh, anyways, it's an interesting book. We did have in our book, we plan not to have a hack for diffraction, but it turns out that we have a hack for diffraction and dispersion. Why do um, rainbows happen? And yes, we don't use ether. Um, so uh, interesting, but it's just another model out there. Um, I think people will find it interesting. Um, and then our community news. James Keene is starting to 
put out some of these things. We, we did this. I need to rebrand them all because we have a lot of memes that we put out that I put out on Facebook that um, have really clever sayings to get people interested. And it has science woke. Now I got to change all the science woke to beyond uh, mainstream. So I'm going to rebrand those and get those out there uh, if you go to that. So don't, I'm not going to tell you where they are because we do need to uh, update those. But you can see this says this guy has, has a paper in physics review without citing binary mechanics. Obviously, James Keen, uh, his theory is binary mechanics, and he's got the uh, famous um, uh, Godfather scene here, and he says, put a, pri put a primary constant in his bed while he's sleeping. You're referring to the horse's head, very famous. I thought it was pretty clever and funny. Um, that's on, These things are on uh, naturalphilosophy.org, so you can go there. This was an old, another one I found on Facebook. I think it was done by a guy that, that he has agreed to be uh, talk with us is carrying on um, uh, Edward Dowdy's work and uh, I think he did this um, and changed it so you know you grab one of these ca uh, cartoons and then you just change the words on it so it says don't uh, don't question me and the next one says don't question this book the other one is why I don't question anything and then of course the person is uh, standing there and says and that's giving a uh, talk to his uh, professors or, or uh, students and he says and that's why I never question anything you see him very happy getting his um, well I should get my pointed out here. You can see him very happy, of course, getting his diploma. And there he is sitting in his office now with his PhD in relativity. Pretty interesting. Of course, you know, our chief scientist does have a PhD in relativity from MIT, and it doesn't work. So that's very interesting that she got a PhD in relativity and her first application for it didn't work. So anyways, oh, I guess that doesn't happen. Now, here's some interesting community news. Um, for those who don't keep up with social media and don't care about it, um, that's okay. But of course, that's where, where, where the world works. That's why we are getting new people and new faces at our CNPS um, website and our organization. So you can say it doesn't work. I don't pay attention to it. But guess what? That's where people are today, and we get people from that, and we make, we make a great presence on YouTube and also on Facebook. And there is another one out there, and I've tested the waters, and it is fantastic. <clears throat> and if you have not uh, gone to Clubhouse, you're going to probably think this is too screwy. I mean, especially people who are older. I'm 61, but of course I grew up. I started programming when it was in the, uh, 1978, um, uh, before almost half the people here or more were not even born. And uh, I uh, have always followed the internet because I got, I, because I was in research in artificial intelligence, we actually were using a browser before anybody even knew that was. That was in the early 1990s. And so I've always kept up to it and, with it, and I know that's where things are happening. Well, Clubhouse is the latest. Well, what is Clubhouse? It's a new social media platform that is on fire. No, it's not like TikTok. It's actually being used by uh, uh, not young kids. It's actually more professional and older people in general. Um, this is not where you'll find kids. So it is on smartphones only. You're going, why? Why would anybody do that? Well, guess what? 60 to 70% of all interaction in the internet is used on the phone. Well, what makes this interesting, it's audio only. You don't have to worry about uh, video. And you go in and you can uh, ascend. Uh, well, I don't even have a, a picture of it. But basically, mm, I should have put a picture of what that is. But um, oh, I think I may have. Um, to, 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 oh, I know. I can share a website and show you uh, later on. But anyways, if you want to join in, what's happening is I created a club. On Clubhouse, you create clubs called Beyond Mainstream Science, and you can see here our new logo, which is there's the stream, and oops, somebody's going off mainstream, and uh, of course, you know, the color is there, that's water, this is red, being alert, somebody's going, eh, oops. I think everybody gets it. Anyways, I've created it, and you can actually, I, what I did is on beyondmainstream.org, you can put these, of course, sub, sub, uh, uh, domains. And if you go on your smartphone, I'm going to say it again. If you go on your smartphone with this, uh, and you go to your browser, you put this in, it will get you and say, do you want to join? And this is the page you will see. David D. Hilser invited you to Clubhouse. And you put in your phone number. Yes, yes, all works on phone number. And then you say next, etc., etc. Now, what does 
uh, Clubhouse do? Well, I've also joined in on it in two other areas that I'm interested, which is whole plant-based diets, which I'm on, reverse my heart disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and my allergies are gone. All those things are gone because of my diet. But again, I'm just talking about the uh, the subject matter. And there's like 150,000 people in the whole plant-based food uh, groups. And people will, during the entire week will put together a group and start discussing. What's really great is if you're working like I do pro computer programming and on uh, I'm no one's out in my office while I'm programming. I can listen in on those and participate just with my voice. You don't have to watch. You don't have to worry about video. And it's quite interesting. And they got all these little rules that go on. So you have moderators and they let you in if you can raise your hand if you want to have a question or a comment um, and uh, all kinds of things that there are formalisms that have developed um, and it is catch is on fire. I did this for my um, uh, computer programming language called NLP++. I'm in the area of computers, uh, supercomputers and human language and invented this new language which is now uh, about 20 years old but now is open source etc etc and I got on there and I started talking about it and wow there was lots of interest and I already made one call for dissident science but I decided to make another group called beyond mainstream science because it's probably less controversial and um, people are already signing up for it so please 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 go there even if you don't use it i try to pe tell people uh, I, don't, I don't pay attention to it that's not my thing oh and, and then they tell me at the same time well you know why doesn't anybody pay attention to my work <laughs> <laughs> what, what do i need to say to you uh, here folks if you don't like social media if you think it's a joke and you don't want to participate in it and at the same time you have things you want to say and other people to listen to you are you have a paradox a grand paradox because that's the way the world works we don't have typewriters we don't have dial telephones we have the internet and we have a way of meeting there and that not only that we have people from all around the world i mean we didn't have that at all so now we have that so if you are an older gentleman or, or an older uh, lady and you have been working and you just say i don't use this then um you're not you're not helping yourself out so even if you don't or plan to use clubhouse go to your phone do these things it takes a few seconds help out our community folks um, when you when you are watching this did you hit the like button oh it's that do well if the more likes the algorithms for youtube will send more people our way so please all the things 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 matter and yes this is a lot of fun and i planned to have sessions throughout the week. I'm going to put up a, a, a session there when I'm working and stuff. Um, I want to put it up and just discuss it maybe on a lunch hour and people will pop in. Why do we do this? Why am I asking you to do this? Because this has millions of people coming on daily. They are gaining millions. This is like the next kind of Facebooky thing. And with all and not only that, it isn't the kids. This isn't TikTok where people make funky videos for 12 seconds and their expand their attention span is is, thir is three seconds. No, these are people discussing very ama amazing things. And it is a platform. So if you come up to have a question or you talk, we have all these unwritten rules that is, hey, give a person a chance. You can talk a little bit. We cut you off and say, okay, that's good. Anybody else, next person. But you get really amazing information. People are going to this and they're finding great value in it. So please, 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 um, if you're watching this recording, go to club.beyondmainstream.org, uh, put in your phone number, you got to do it on your smartphone, and look for alerts so when we start uh, a topic on something, then we can talk. And why is that important? Because we will start gathering new people into the group just like we do with youtube just like we do with facebook all right so that is that um and if you if i find other people who are good moderators i can allow them to put their own um uh group to starting a group and they talk again it's all audio it's not chat it's not type in uh there is no type in well i think that's one of the people why reasons people like it because it's super simple you got your your photo there you talk you unmute you mute and um you guys people discuss things in a very uh, orderly manner so alrighty.
enough of that and play coming attractions all right i will do that where are there okay here we go Yes, sir. You saw some uh, something new there, I, I would imagine. But of course, Steve Bryan is. We're waiting to see if he's getting published in another place. But he is totally on board to be talking, and uh, hopefully uh, that will happen soon. But I am conversations with him, so um, that's great. Um, of course, then this is a new person. If you don't know him, James Verbelli. Um, he just got done having a. a he, a huge presentation actually i think that's him in a lab with like magnets and things um he's a an, i think he's from more the electric universe side but he ha he is actually continuing um dr edward dowdy's extinction shift theory and um that is quite interesting uh, on facebook you can look him up and he's got a lot of his work and really sort of nice graphics but i've talked with him and he and i are going to be talking about him coming on and talking uh, he's got a lot to say, and of course, uh, Ed, Ed Dowdy was a very close friend of mine um, in the in the sense of a colleague in this area. He appears in my film uh, uh, EinsteinWrong.com. He was a, a NASA scientist. He worked with laser um, uh, lasers, I guess. Um, in the area of astronomy, I believe. Uh, laser astronomy, if there's such a thing. And I don't quote me on any of this stuff. But um, he was the person who, uh, a NASA scientist, actually on Einstein's Facebook page, he went viral for a little while because the people on Einstein, the uh, kid who runs it and is linked with the uh, university in Israel there, they were all worried because if a NASA scientist is saying general relativity is not correct, oh my gosh, so they were in a panic a few years ago and uh, he got he got quite a lot of attention. But um, he basically says that uh, general relativity is not correct, that light and gravity don't directly interact and that um, what's really happening is light is, being bend, is bending because of the corona mass around the sun not because of space time and then outside the corona things don't it, it doesn't bend so i he i guess uh, james it has is uh, continuing that work so that's uh, going to be interesting hope we'll talk to him and yes dr alexander unsucker has talked with me he says pick a date so i will pick a date uh, maybe even next week so you do want to stay uh, uh tuned he is an absolute big thinker. I really like him. Um, he uh, always jokes with me, you know, he says, well, maybe I shouldn't, I've written the book, The Higgs Fake, which which blows the whistle on all particle physics. I mean, you got to read that because if you think particle physics is a solid engineering and, and um, endeavor and all of their methods are uh, straightforward and also uh, uh, trustworthy, oh, my goodness of course um he didn't endear himself so uh, uh becoming a science evangelist and making money at telling people how to understand hard hard things in physics is something he sometimes he's said he's not sure he did the right thing but he did the right thing in the end he also wrote bo a book einstein's lost keys you got to check out his channel uh, it's um the machian uh is called but you can look up dr alexander unsker the machian t-h-e-m-a-c-h-i-a-n if you look up the machian you'll get to his youtube channel i would suggest you subscribe to it it's uh, really good so we'll be talking with him and uh then of course we will be talking uh probably my guess is in maybe July when our book comes out. It will be coming out on Amazon across the world. And um, hack, uh, complete toolkit for hacking the physical universe. Uh, so, yeah, we give physicality absolutely everything right or wrong. So, uh, so today, play today's Bumper David. And that's what I will do. Make sure I pick on the right one. Yes, today we'll be talking with James Marison about his local ether theory, a viable alternative to relativity. 
Um, good marketing, good marketing, of course. Um, if you don't know who James Marison is, he has a Bachelor of Arts from Columbia University, Co Columbia College in Columbia University in, 19, in 1970. Uh, a, a a uh, bachelor of science and masters uh, of I guess engineering and school of engineer applied science at Columbia very good university obviously so he must be a real smart guy huh <laughs> uh, MS and ME in plasma physics school of engineering and, and science at Columbia University is he ever going to leave the university the guy is going to become too knowledgeable uh, and a PhD in plasma physics graduated uh, School of Arts and Science Columbia University 1976 and 1979 quite an amazing resume I don't know a whole lot more about him because his, uh, he is uh, uh, so I'm gonna ask him before he starts uh, I don't think this is gonna be the only talk with from him because he's got a lot to say but I'm gonna bring him on here let me bring this down and bring him up uh, there he is. Hello, Jim Marison. How are you? Hey, how's it going? Very good. Thank you so much for coming on. Why don't you tell us a little bit about you, how you got into this? Um, I didn't find a bio on you, so if you don't write a bio um, and don't want to talk about yourself, um, then uh, this is the way to do it. So <laughs> give me a hard time. But no, tell, tell us, how did you get it? I mean, it, I am always curious, and I think it's always great for the audience's why in the heck are you even suggesting a local ether theory and and saying there's better alternatives to Einstein's relativity? Just give us a little background before you start your talk here. Well, actually, um, my dad uh, had a theory about ether uh, when I was growing up. Uh, oh, wow. The Tron theory. Oh, yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you remember back in 2016, I gave a talk on it. Uh, Oops, sorry. Yep, I got the wrong one. Yeah, I did actually. So um, hold on. Okay. Yeah, I did. I remember the Tron theory because it's easy to remember that name. So yeah. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, the uh, Disney or they, they came along and made a movie about Tron. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was before the Tron, right? So they right. was a, was the movie named after his work? No. <laughs> So, okay, so your dad was already into it. How old are you, were you when you sort of knew about it? Did he, like, force you to read about it and put you in a room and, and teach you uh, and hit you with a cane if you didn't read his theory? Or how? <laughs> um, No, he just um, saw what he was doing, asked him about it, and uh, got interested in it. I've always been uh, interested in science and engineering, tech stuff, the techie, nerd, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Okay, and then how did you get to your your theory, your uh, work um, specifically? Well, it's, it's because it started theory. with Tron. It, oh, it's not your theory, yes. Well, I mean, it, I support the work of uh, Professor Ching Chuan Tzu. Right. Uh, and it was actually his theory that. Uh, and, but how did you meet him then? I mean, he didn't come along as well and say, Jim Marison, I picked you randomly out of the, <laughs> the universe and you are now going to promote my theory. How did you find him? What, what was, tell us the backstory on that. No, I never met him. Uh, he, he actually passed away in 2006 he, at age 55, unfortunately. Oh, did you, did you know about his work before he had passed away? Yeah. Uh, okay. In fact, I was... Put, Tried to send an email to contact him, and I got a letter back from the secretary saying, oh, <laughs> too bad." <laughs> oh yeah, fifty-five's young too. Okay, yeah. and and what what got you to him? Was it by accident? Were you looking actively? Were you just uh, curious about ether in general and started working? Give tell us that. Well, certainly, um, I'm interested in uh, ether theories. Uh, I, I don't actually remember uh, how I heard about him. Uh, it's weird, although, huh? Uh, <clears throat> His theory is actually uh, almost identical to uh, Peter Beckman's theory. I mean, oh, okay. Peter Beckman? Yes, of course. Absolutely. Uh, if you're from the yeah. NPA and CMPS and don't know Peter Beckman, I don't have any of his books, though. Sorry? I don't have any of his books. Oh, I have. Well, anyway, I first um, saw an ad uh, in Science Magazine or, or some uh, mainstream science magazine for his theory and I uh, was curious about it and uh, studied, got his book and 
wrote about his um, Galilean electrodynamics uh, journal that he, that he created. By the way, do you know of John Chappelle back then? You know, I, I, that's a good question. I think who would know that answer for, for sure would be, well, I'm not, maybe not. Um, well, I think it's, P it's, P it's Peter Beckman, right? Peter Beckman? Correct. Yeah. I, I, if I were to, if I were to gamble on it, if somebody made me gamble $100 on it, I would say yes. I would say they knew about it. Yeah. I'm just wondering knew. if uh, there's any connection between CMPS well, you know, and, and Yeah, we have all the events of all the CMPS events, at least through the mid 2000s. And, and every person that we knew was there, we have a catalog. So it could be that we could find Peter Beckman and John Chappelle at the same because John Chappelle was alive until early 2000s, 2002, I think. And so if Peter Beckman and he were at the same conference, then of course they would know about it because well, he Beckman was in charge. Beckman actually died in 1993. Oh, oh I didn't. <laughs> I didn't get that part, yeah, because there have been people that are sim similar to him that uh, I did meet, so I, I I forgot that part. Just so many people, so okay, yeah, I I don't know. Then then I would my bet has just changed. I'm well, putting it on well, I'm putting on red now, not black. So. I, I think Cynthia probably must have known it because she published papers in G in his in GED. Uh, okay, around, okay. Before he died, I believe. Okay, so yeah. okay, so you learned, you know, you you knew about Peter Beckman's work, and he was an etherist as well then? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah. He, okay. he never called it the local ether, but it's essentially a local ether. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and is, is a local ether same as entrained? Well, it's entrained with a little twist. Very important twist. Oh, a real twist or just a figuratively <laughs> twist? <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Well, it gives me a little idea about how you got involved with this. So you're really presenting other people's ideas that you uh, uh, really subscribe to, correct? Yeah. Subscribe okay. and would like to promote. Okay. Ótimo. Ótimo. See, like I speak Portuguese. Great. Ótimo. Optimum. All right. Anyways, what I'll do is I'll put your... Uh, uh, I guess your screen up there. If you can get that as big as possible, that would be great. Um, I don't know. Can you do that? Okay. Now, are you able to go and still manipulate those things? Yep. Hello. Hello. He is frozen. Frozen did. We may have lost him, folks. I know that can happen. Uh, let me remove this. Yeah, okay. It's essentially a compilation of his papers. Okay, we, we lost you for a while. Okay, you were frozen. So I think we're good now. So I'm going to okay. remove. And by the way, this is uh, Peter Beckman's book. Hello. I have seen the cover. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, hi. <laughs> okay, yeah, we're having a little communication problems, I think, from your end to us. So. Is this uh, share screen uh, too, too tough? No, it's okay. We'll just let, we'll let you go. I'll keep ahead of it. You, you just go ahead and go forward, okay? Okay. So, um, th uh, just, did you, this is Peter Beckman's book that he wrote in 1986? Yes, yes. Yes, I did see that. I, I'm familiar. I've seen the cover, but I, I don't have it. Is it available anywhere? Not really. I mean, sometimes you'll see a used copy on Amazon. They, they actually, at some point, were up as high as seven hundred dollars. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, how many pages is it? Uh, it's like two hundred something. Yeah, so. I mean these are these are digitizable. You can you can get a book digitized. And... I have a digitized copy of it. So, well, then we but, should talk to his relatives and see if they want to get it out there again. It's so cheap yeah. to do. So do you, if you know of his relatives, maybe you get permission yeah. to republish it. Actually, he had a, uh, one major supporter by the name of uh, Howard Hayden, Professor Howard Hayden from uh, University of Connecticut, uh, <clears throat> who uh, actually has the rights to it now. Oh, okay. Well, maybe yeah, we should I've, talk to him about it. I, I have emailed with him to suggest that he get it republished but uh yeah you got to bug people you got to get on the case he's in his 80s now and, 
seems to have lost interest pretty much in yeah. the idea. Well, but if there's anybody out there that supports these theories, I'd love to hear from you or of you. Or, or, okay. Well, let's go forward and uh, maybe you'll get more supporters presenting <laughs> this. Okay. I'll let you go. I, okay. You go ahead now. Go forward. It's, the floor is yours. Okay. So, um, if you uh, want to think about the gravitational potential, okay, let me uh, call it, uh, the gravitational potential around a uh, uh, celestial body, there is, goes, drops off as, as one over R as you travel away from it. And so, you can see the gravity potential field around the Earth, around the Sun, around every planet. And as you orbit the Sun, <clears throat> you carry that potential field with you. Okay? And <clears throat> the, uh, the point is that this is a uh, well-accepted concept that you can uh, carry this, to, essentially the gravitational potential field of the celestial body is entrained with it. And more, most importantly, it does not rotate with it. Its effective orientation is fixed with, result, with respect to the, uh, the galaxy or the stars or, outer, uh, or, or all galaxies. So the Earth, is when it, as it's rotating on its axis, is spinning within that but not, but it doesn't spin with it, okay? And that's essentially what the local ether is, uh, except that it's a real substance, has a minute mass density that is proportional to the gravitational potential field. So <clears throat> it has the same distribution in space as the gravitational potential field. And that's what uh, Sue called the, uh, the local ether. That's essentially the, the, the uh, main postulates of his idea. And as well as uh, Beckman, actually the, the only real difference between Beckman and, and Sue was that Beckman insisted on thinking of the local ether as the gravitational force field, G, small g. Whereas uh, Sue, <coughs> uh, insisted or preferred to think of it as gravitational potential field, which the gradient of is the force field. But they're essentially the same thing. And if you don't try to go into the more detailed pro properties of the ether, you can solve a lot of problems this way. I'm thinking of a, uh, a field that, or a, a paradigm for, for uh, physics, going back to before Einstein, absolute time and Euclidean three-dimensional space, Cla return to that classical paradigm. So <clears throat> what does that give you? It gives you the Sagnac effect very simply. Uh, <clears throat> it gives you uh, Ex explanation for the Michelson Morley null results, uh, <clears throat> which uh, essentially turn out to be that the Earth is, entrains its ether, so it, the, the motion of the galaxy or the of the solar system with respect to the galaxy or the gal or the Milky Way with respect to the rest of the universe is that motion is essentially blocked out, and all you have. For mo you do, but you do have uh, motion with respect to the local ether, which, as you're spinning, provides uh, <coughs> uh, a uh, much lower but actual uh, ether wind in effect. And it's so low that a second order experiment like the Michelson interferometer can barely detect it, if at all. Although there's, Professor Hayden uh, has a paper that uh, 
claims to uh, that it shows that an experiment in 1979, it's the famous uh, Brillier Hall experiment, which was an attempt to uh, create a Michelson uh, experiment with a Fabry Pro uh, uh, filter optical cavity. Uh, instead of uh, uh, the traditional, um, traditional, uh, excuse me, uh, mirrors and on arms like like uh, the original uh, and all of the repeats essentially in, of that experiment uh, up until uh, the '60s when uh, lasers be. Uh, were invented. So he, he showed that they actually had a result that was consistent with uh, rotation of the earth, either when due only to the rotation of the earth, whereas uh, the, the uh, uh, scientists who did the experiment were looking, were essentially assuming the universal ether model, where there was only one homogeneous ether, essentially this is flat, it's no, it's, the ether distribution is flat and, uh, throughout the universe, so you would expect to see a velocity of the, earth, of the earth either due to its orbit around the sun, seven, uh, <coughs> which would give a 7,000 7, times stronger result than uh, than just due to the Earth's rotation. So that <clears throat> that's kind of a, a unique explanation for why there is a uh, uh, supposed apparent uh, null result to Michelson Rowling type experiments. Uh, <clears throat> so um, Another point about this ether model is that uh, it uh, has a, an alternative explanation for time dilation and uh, uh, essentially the uh, dependence of uh, the atomic clock rates on speed with respect to the local ether and the uh, uh, gravitational potential. Whereas it's a real effect due to an intrinsic quantum pro property of the atom, uh, rather than a uh, magical uh, result of applying Einstein's uh, Lorentz translation. So um, I wrote this paper uh, a couple of months ago, essentially an overview of uh, uh, Sue's work. Um, now the, uh, uh, the Sagnac effect is one of the strongest evidences that there's a preferred reference frame within the sphere of influence of the uh, local ether of a, of a body. Essentially, the, uh, there was an experiment called the Michelson Gale it was done in the 20s. Whereas, actually, Michelson probably really was the first one to promote the idea of a, of a local ether in effect, uh, which is what inspired him to do a uh, Michelson uh, Gale experiment where it's essentially a uh, uh, <clears throat> a Sagnac experiment done on the uh, where the, the method of rotating the, Sag the Sagnac interferometer, loop interferometer, uh, was uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the rotation of the Earth. So 
what they did, I mean, they had a positive result and they did detect uh, the rotation of the earth with respect to essentially the local ether. They, they detected that velocity and uh, the, there are, um, now, that, now with ring laser gyroscopes, uh, you can detect this uh, all the time, 24 seven with a uh, uh, ring laser gyro that you can build in your basement, <laughs> which uh, was actually done by uh, uh, a guy by the name of Doug Moret. <laughs> So, but it's, what this leads to is that a, the cyanide effect is called the first order effect. Uh, that it's proportion it's proportional to the velocity with respect to the ether divided by the speed of light. Uh, so um, <clears throat> it's much easier to detect than with the uh, Michelson interferometer, which is a second order. Uh, type experiment because it uh, uh, with the mirrors you're reflecting the, the light ray and that cancels the first order of the uh, uh, effect so you're left with a much smaller uh, effect that is much more difficult to detect so the the um, the Sagnac effect when it was discovered uh, in the, uh, 1913 by George Sagnac, uh, by essentially uh, uh, sending light rays around uh, the uh, around a, a, uh, a circular table in opposing directions and rotating it. Um, <clears throat> when uh, special relativity type uh, explanations are attempted, they always assume that it's due to the area enclosed by the, uh, by the reflecting uh, light path and the rotation rate, whereas the Sagnac effect is actually it's very simple. If you uh, imagine a, uh, a pond and a boat in the pond, in the middle of the uh, near the middle of the pond, then you drop a rock into the middle of the pond. The uh, the waves, the water waves. Uh, propagate out from the center. And if the uh, boat is still not moving, it takes a certain amount of time for that, for the wave front to reach the boat. But if the boat is moving away from the rock, it, it takes longer for the uh, wave front to overtake the boat. So the distance, the propagation distance is actually uh, longer, and therefore the propagation time is actually longer, and the effective propagation speed is slower. And that's what's going on, with, and that's all there is to it. It's a very simple explanation of the Sagnac effect, uh, <clears throat> which uh, is uh, <clears throat> the Sagnac effect that uh, does not uh, require rotation or uh, anything else that uh, is made very complicated by uh, special relativity attempts to explain it. And in fact, and actually, there's a very strong disproof of relativity because relativity would say that for a straight, that rotation is required. You have to accelerate the, uh, the reference frame or something. And it would not, would not work if uh, you're talking about straight line 
uh, relative motion of the source and the uh, receiver. But that's not true because, uh, and there's an experiment done by uh, uh, R-U-Y-O-N-G Wang in 2003 that actually was published in Physics Letters that uh, where he took a uh, fiber optic uh, gyro and instead of ha just having it uh, rotate circular, he uh, uh, had a straight line path and added into the uh, into the loop and showed that the longer the loop uh, or the faster the uh, the, uh, the loop was was running produced an effect essentially showing a sagnac a linear sagnac effect and that uh, can't be explained. It's swept under the rug by uh, people that try to explain it uh, in the context of relativity. What am I doing here? <laughs> no, things are fine. Keep going. Nope. So, am I making sense so far? Is, is anything? Well, no. I mean, people are. We're, I'm. I'm following it. It's you know. You want to keep. Uh, Obviously, you need to make a enough of the presentation so people can get an idea of, you know, what uh, you're presenting, and then we can have questions for that. So, just keep going. Okay. So, um, in his in, in Sue's uh, main uh, paper, uh, he. Uh, He has two, two of his papers are, are the most important. The first one is uh, called the local ether model of uh, what is it? I had it. <laughs> oh, well. uh, here it is. Right. Local ether model of uh, Explain what you're doing as you're doing things that will help people. What are you I'm looking for and why? Me. Sorry, I'm trying to find the, the, uh, the paper. Paper about? Uh, of Sue's, Sue's uh, uh, paper called the local internet model of, uh, here it is. Yeah, this is it. Maybe if you could expand that and then put it to wide. So make that the entire window and then make the expansion wide so people can read it. Because right, really, right now, uh, unless they have a, they're sitting at a yeah, computer. Yeah, I don't, I don't really expect anybody to try to read this point, but, uh, Yeah, but I mean, at least it'll be closer. So. Okay. There you go. Is that a little easier? Yeah, a little bit more. Okay. All right. That helps. Okay. So here's where he goes into uh, defining the local ether and uh, showing how the segment effect. Uh, can, can you, you know, I'm going to, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I mean, we're talking about local ether all the time. I know, uh, I know there's some trained ether. Explain to a person who has no idea what local ether means instead of just ether. I mean, you said even Michael Michelson and Morley, Mickelson and Morley also talked about it. You know, give it to us. You know, in a, a simple terms, what you know, what, where's the ether? Is it moving with the earth? You know, those kinds of things. Can you give us an ex uh, some explanation for that? Okay, um, we go back to, uh, so when uh, in the 19th century, there were actually two competing 
uh, ideas about the ether. One was that it was the same everywhere. It's like that. It was the, the Earth was moving in the ether, correct? Throughout the yeah, it's the same throughout the universe. Right. So bodies were moving, and the ether was sort of a stationary frame somewhere. Exactly, stationary frame. One okay. frame for the whole. Right. Earth. And what Which was is, the other? You know, Sorry. Well, what was the other one you were saying? Um, there was this, the uh, Stokes uh, ether, which uh, was an entrained ether, but it wasn't. It wasn't well defined, and uh, there were some objections to it. Uh, and I guess the more the most influential physicists of the time, like uh, Lorentz and Poincaré, uh, promoted the. Uh, the universal ether idea so that was kind of the, the mainstream idea and so how does local differ from all that it's okay so you're not you're saying it's not like the mainstream idea where it's like a uh, frame in the universe uh, where everything's moving through it it's not like entrained ether which is basically as ether is is close to any large body that it's actually moving with the body how is lo what's the difference what's local ether yeah that's that's local ether essentially well but that's what that yeah I would, you're saying it's not entrained but it that is it isn't trained it is, it is trained oh, okay but okay. the twist that i was mentioning at the beginning is that it doesn't rotate with with the celestial body it's, it's directionally oh, okay. fixed in space so it, it's like a it's, it's uh beckman explained it it's it's like a uh, a dancer with a uh, hoop skirt but the hoop skirt is not uh, attached to her body. So as she spins uh, pirouettes, the uh, uh, hoop skirt doesn't move. So if you're doing a Michael Mickelson Morley experiment, the Earth's rotating, wouldn't you get some difference in, uh, so instead of an ether wind, you're dealing with a something that's not moving. And if it's not moving as well, it's not moving as compared to what? Just no, the entire no, universe? The, the, earth, the earth is the, is the dancer that's spinning. No, I understand that. But, okay. It's, and, and you so, have entrained, mean it, but I, entrained, you're saying it's not entrained. It's what? More ether around a body and less ether as you go away? Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, the, uh, the strength of, of the... Uh, where the density of, of the ether reduces as you go away from the okay okay so all right until, until it matches the density of the, uh, the body that's it's uh, embedded in as you can see here eventually the, the sun's gravitational potential matches the, uh, the gravitational potential of, of the earth so that's where the influence of the Earth's local ether ends, and we switch into the local ether of the Sun. Okay, so is the is that a density difference? Is what you're saying? It's a density difference and a gradient difference. Well, the, yeah, the, right. Understood. Okay, gotcha. And. Um, Again, I'm not. I'm not here. I'm not criticizing anyway. I'm just trying to understand myself and sort That's of visual, visually. That's I want to. I'm glad to. Yeah, to and then you. and so so okay. So in some sense, the thing it shares in common with the ether, the ether of the 19th century, Mickelson Morley, uh, before the 20th century, is that it is somewhat. It is a frame, right? Uh, the difference well, is. It's not one frame. It's it's different frames between different positions in the, in the universe well i'm talking about the ether itself uh, uh, the speed of the ether other than it's going back and forth is ether moving in any way because you're saying the difference is it's not spinning with the earth for instance right for so earth, right. if if it's not spinning yeah. it for means it's frame. right but i mean if it's not spinning it's not res it's not spinning in in respect to what the earth right it's not spinning with respect to the rest of the universe. Right. So if so there's, if the ETH. You hear the, the um, Earth-centered inertial frame, inertial reference frame? 
Right. I understand. I understand all that. What I'm saying is the twist that you're saying that your this uh, theory puts on it is that the entrained ether, if you think of ether like water, and uh, it would be more of the traditional entrained, you know, you spin around the water sort of starts spinning with you a little bit as you go further away from the body. Of course, it's not spinning very much at all. And eventually it's just not really felt. Here, what you're saying is, no, the earth spinning in the ether, if it's like a water, but it's not really like a water because it would, it doesn't spin with the earth. It um, spins and, and there is a, so that is while the earth's spinning, it's spinning and the ether is, if you were to put a, a marker or a, um, a coordinate system on a, an ether particle, it would be staying still in space and the earth would be, as the earth would spin around. Is that correct? spin within it correct rotate within it and um if you think of gravitational potential it doesn't rotate with the earth or, or whatever body it's uh, sure coming sure out sure but the ether though unless it's a uh, gravitonic field which is um, made by um, gravitons going in all random directions this ether is going to be if it's not going with the earth it's got to be in some type of reference frame so the ether that's surrounding the earth and the sun is in what kind of reference frame then well like you said each each inertial reference frame is unique for that body no i'm not talking about the earth and the sun i'm talking about i'm going to just don't think about well, the earth and body i'm just thinking like I'm this i'm trying to think about the composition or uh, the uh, you know, what kind of particles it might be made out of or not or just but if you know but I, I understand what you say not think about that but then then you tell then i i guess i i and again i'm not arguing i'm just trying to understand that sort of goes against the idea that think of the earth as a dancer spinning and this hoop skirt and the hoop skirt stays still the question especially with people who are looking at relativity and reference frames and inertial frames whatever will be say okay it's still according to what so you, you but you said something to me which sort of answered the question which is it's like the older ether where you know the ether is sort of a, a universal sort of reference frame it gets there's more dense there's gradient in the ether the only difference it doesn't spin with anything that happens to be spinning let's say we got a, a body that isn't spinning compared to the reference the ether frame what i'm saying is that frame you you did say it was like the frame for um um uh, gravitational uh, potential no, no, it's like the frame of the older ether, which is like it's sitting there. The Earth's moving through it. What you're saying is that as the Earth's moving through the ether, the, um, it, the, the, the potential of the ether field or particles, because it's, it's got to be made of something, are those, the density is moving with the, is, the density is moving with the body. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, no, I mean, is that correct? Yeah, that makes that's that's fine. Okay, okay. Oops, I'm getting all this wrong. Hold on, I got to get these. There we go. There we go. Okay, so all right. So the density is changing. So if I'm an ether particle, and the density is changing as the Earth's rotating around the sun, for instance, the potential or the the thickness of the ether or the dense i'm sorry th sorry the, the the density of the ether is uh, around the body is measurable and pretty much same all around just like gravitational but if i'm an actual ether particle if i put myself standing on an actual ether particle and the earth's moving by what happens does the you're saying the ether doesn't travel with it is that right uh look not sure if I'll you. Okay, you have the Earth there, which is that little blue ball, or is that the moon? Yeah, that's the, that's the blue ball. And, and right, okay. So that blue ball, uh, the, the, the gradient that I'm seeing both in the, is the gradient that is in the end turns out to be gravitational, but it's a gradient in the ether itself, right? Okay, and as that as that blue ball is moving around, that little hole sort of move or that gradient moves with it, right? Right. 
The question is, I have, and it's just a mechanical question, is the ether, it's the, what you're saying, the ether itself isn't moving. So as it's moving, ether around bodies is, um, the gradient stays, but the actual ether particle itself, you know, it's going to move on and the earth's going to move on and the, the ether will stay. So if I were to take a, a spray paint can and paint one of the ether particles in your gradient and the earth comes by it, it will, you know, go back and forth. Maybe it'll move forward or back or whatever. But as it goes by it, it will then remain in its more or less in its place. Obviously, it's going back and forth, hitting in other ether particles to transmit waves, I guess, for light, right? So that's what I'm asking as the gradient changes, but the ether particles themselves will stay. So if right where that earth is right now, if there was an ether particle that was a foot above the ground, and then that now that earth is a is a thousand mile a thousand kilometers away that ether particle is now a thousand kilometers away as well is that right that's a question uh does the gravitational potential uh no i'm not talking about the gravitational p potential i'm saying that ether is ether is made up of particles in this model correct whether whether, whether there are particles that are carried with the uh, with the earth or the as you say the gradient uh is instantaneously affected by the orbit of, orbit of the earth uh i'm not sure actually. okay so okay you're not too sure okay and and, and and if you say if they move with it the only difference about that not being the same as normal entrained is it's not rotating as well that's the only difference that's that's the uh, that's the key difference. That, okay, uh, got gotcha. you. Okay. That results, that results All right. About the similarly, um, side there. Okay. Okay. I, I've asked a lot of questions, but I think I've got a picture of what your model is. My idea is again to understand your model from your perspective. So, okay. All right, and uh, I will let you continue. So. One of the uh, pri another primary example of uh, the uh, evidence in, in favor of this local ether model is the GPS. Uh, <clears throat> so, one fact about the GPS that is uh, really uh, contradicts relativity is that uh, the, uh, all the clocks around the Earth and on the GPS satellites can be synchronized. And according to relativity, they actually should, can't be. I think uh, one of the big uh, etherists, Ashby, uh, even talked about a, uh, <clears throat> a local ether <laughs> effect surrounding the Earth to uh, uh, explain the uh, 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 the fact that the, all the clocks can be synchronized as as if there is an is an absolute time. There is, uh, according to relativity, all the different velocities of the satellites and different locations of the of the ground stations, or even your your phone when you use uh, Google Maps should all be having different relative velocities and different clock rates. Uh, <clears throat> and then on top of that, there's what uh, is called the pseudo range correction that's built into the uh, uh, <clears throat> the uh, <clears throat> algorithms for uh, every GPS uh, receiver essentially where the uh, motion of the receiver on the surface of the earth when it's moving with respect to the uh, ECI or the local ether because of the earth's rotation if uh, the receiver is moving away from the, the satellite when it emits a, uh, a pulse uh, the Sagnac effect, it's, a, it's actually a linear one-way Sagnac effect. It doesn't even, it has nothing to do with rotation. Uh, 
the change in distance between the satellite and the receiver has to be factored in. Whereas uh, that that's not really allowed by uh, relativity. And he, uh, he also shows that <coughs> the uh, there's a uh, um, phenomenon called the intercontinental microwave link, where uh, the uh, you have two uh, ground stations, one located in New York and one located in uh, San Francisco, say. Uh, <clears throat> they uh, send uh, pulses to each other and record the time of, of transmission and reception. And they find that uh, or relaying, re relaying them through a satellite, possibly a geostationary satellite. Uh, they find that there's a difference in the time of propagation uh, if the uh, signal is sent from San Francisco to New York, it takes longer to get there by uh, tens of microseconds than if it's transmitted the other way from New York to the, the, the signal is transmitted over the same path at the same time uh, from New York to San Francisco. And again, this is due to a one-way Zagnac effect where the transmission distance propagation, the actual propagation dis distance changes the rotation of the Earth with respect to the uh, ECI, which is the reference frame for the local ether. Does that make sense? Okay. And a third uh, point here is that uh, the uh, Inter, uh, interplanetary microwaves. This is literally uh, uh, discussed by Shapiro. Uh, shows that uh, it's the uh, motion of the relative motion of the uh, receiver of a of a microwave pulse sent from the Earth to either. Uh, it originally was done by reflecting it off of uh, the planet Venus, and now it's done uh, routinely uh, reflecting or tr transponding signals to uh, interplanetary spacecraft, either on Mars or around Mars or on the way to Mars. <laughs> uh, the same effect of uh, the Sagnac effect occurs, but it's Due to the sun's local ether, the, it's traveling most of the time through uh, the sun's local ether, which is uh, well. Anyway, it, the, uh, the, the this local ether theory is uh, uh, shows that that, that difference in, or switchability of reference frames or propagation medium that are, uh, you have to measure your receiver's velocity switches from uh, the Earth's local reference frame to, to the sun's. So as I already explained, the uh, 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 about the Marcus and Moore experiment. By the way, this also has uh, uh, Hayden uh, and points out would be uh, 
much easier to detect the uh, the local ether with a microcylinder thermometer if you did it on a uh, spacecraft in low Earth orbit because the velocity of the spacecraft with respect to the ECI, the local ether reference frame, would be uh, much higher, maybe three times higher, leading to uh, maybe a 200 uh, higher <coughs> uh, effect on, uh, for a, uh, an equivalent uh, interferometer. So one of the problems of uh, the uh, original Stokes and trained ether model was explaining aberration, stellar aberration. With the local ether model, actually, it's, it's fairly simple. The assumption was back then that the aberration uh, didn't occur until you got to the receiving telescope. The shift in, in the angle of uh, the apparent direction of, to, to a star. But with the local ether model, uh, the uh, alteration of the angle of the wavefront actually happens out where the uh, local ether transitions to of the Earth transitions to the local ether of the Sun. And uh, uh, Beckman actually had a, a paper that uh, explained how this happens. That uh, all the questions about like the area experiment where they put water in a telescope uh, were all kind of uh, for naught because uh, the uh, According to this theory, the uh, alteration of the wavefront took place far away, somewhere past the orbit of the moon. So, uh, <clears throat> entrainment or, or not, this is a, a method to, that this, this shows how it could happen. By the way, I wanted to also mention this book by Tom Bethel, The Question of Einstein. He was a friend of Beckman's, Peter Beckman, and he uh, supported uh, Beckman's uh, local internet. And, is, is that uh, available? Can you get that book anywhere? Yes, that's actually still available as an ebook on uh, uh, Amazon. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, and I think it's about nine bucks or something like that. It's not very bit expensive. That's a lot, but we can. We, <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. We got to work on getting Peter Beckman, maybe get an ebook, talk with that guy. Uh, that would be great because uh, one of the benefits of this, this uh, defining a, a local ether around the earth is that. Uh, it leads to, uh, he was able to essentially uh, derive the Schrodinger equation of quantum mechanics using just classical electromagnet electromagnetism and the idea that there is a, uh, uh, a stationary reference frame, or at least one that uh, is only moving at uh, approximately 300 meters per second. Uh, that uh, a particle like an electron is moving against. So uh, there's this thing in electromagnetism called Lenz's law that whenever you try to uh, ex accelerate a uh, charge, there's a, uh, a back force, uh, reverse EMF it's called, uh, that works to uh, uh, decelerate the particle and this leads to uh, a, uh, an alternating acceleration and deceleration of the particle very very small compared to the particle's average velocity like an electron but it's like a hop the uh, 
the electron is uh, accelerating. It's it's slowed down by the uh, uh, self EMS EMF because it's charged, and then uh, it uh, accelerates again slightly faster than the uh, uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, average velocity. So, uh, a, a couple of questions. So, the uh, uh, is there any talk in the this uh, the local ether about what charges or or how it relates to the ether? Like no, you have an electron. Point. Okay, yeah, not at this charge point. is still a mystery. And a magnetism as well. Uh, Essentially, yeah, the, the, the uh, uh, fundamental nature of, of magnetism, I don't think is clearly understood. But okay, not, 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 this, not in this model, not in this so model, then. Well, not at, the, not at this model with the current level of development. Uh, the, the point is that you can go very far without trying to ask those questions. And at some point, you do need, you would like to ask them, but Mm -hmm. uh, with relativity, you're not even allowed to. It's just, it's just. So, so the, what you're talking about is the local ether theory. You're pretty much talking about electromagnetism and is and gravity. Would I say that too? Gravity and uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, okay, and you haven't talked about the quantum mechanics very much right now, yet until now. I mean, uh, up till now. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Okay. First, first you have to get past the idea of an ether. Mm -hmm. Then you can, then you can see where 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 you're going to go beyond it. That's why uh, Beckman called his book Einstein plus two is because he starts with uh, uh, Einstein plus zero. He has three sections to his book uh, where he tries to show how uh, the uh, uh, experiments that supposedly prove Einstein have alternative uh, explanations in a classical mode. Uh, and then, but then in section two is where he uses the idea of a local ether to derive quantum mechanics, to derive social, essentially a, a Schrodinger equation, uh, which is the essence of quantum mechanics. Uh, <clears throat> and in, in fact, that's what first attracted me to, uh, well, one of the things that first attracted me to Beckman's theory. Uh, because uh, my father's Tron theory also uh, uh, imagined and postulated the uh, uh, oscillation of the particle in terms of its uh, uh, size uh, that he called vibra that led to uh, this uh, oscillation in the velocity of a particle, which, uh, by the way, the the idea of it, uh, that the wavelength of this oscillation is essentially the Broglie wavelength. So it's not just imaginary. Okay, maybe if you could explain a little bit for people in our audience who are not super familiar with Schrodinger's equation what, uh, how, how and why that's important, even to me quantum mechanics? Well, uh, Schrodinger's equation uh, essentially says that there's a, a wave uh, property to uh, matter, matter waves. Right. Uh, whereas uh, uh, Beckman and well, essentially, Beckman uh, shows that the wave is uh, this oscillation, which actually generates a uh, tiny magnetic field oscillation and electric field oscillation that participate in accelerating and decelerating the, uh, the particle, which may in fact be uh, the uh, uh, pilot waves. So is, uh, is the is, uh, is is the wave the wave that Peter Beckman's using is the wave in the ether? 
uh, well, it's it's uh, it's an oscillation. It's an oscillation of the fields around a particle as it's accelerating and decelerating. Right, but what's the I field? Call it the a wave, in the sense that. Well, yeah, but I mean, it doesn't the, propagate like a, a classical. Uh, understood. So, if there's an oscillation, that's, that's understood. Now, is that oscillation happening in the the ether, the local ether? Yeah. Okay. So, what is what is is that part of Coulomb's force, or that keeps the electron going around the the, the nucleus, or not? Really? Well, it shows it shows how. Um, this oscillation of uh, this harmonic uh, speed change uh, when you consider uh, electrons orbiting a uh, nucleus uh, means that the, uh, the stable orbits are the ones where you have a uh, integral number of oscillations around the orbit. And how mm -hmm. that uh, leads to uh, the uh, when the when an electron switches uh, its orbital to a higher level, it has to uh, uh, change its uh, number of integral uh, oscillations, and you you can have uh, uh, an emission of. of uh, of a pulse of EM waves. I don't want to call them photons because right. uh, I don't I mean the whole point of or, or the or one of the beauties of Beckman's idea is that it dispels the uh, wave particle like duality. It shows that the wave, the wave nature of particles is as uh, they uh, they oscillate in a wave like manner and uh, so, are, okay, so oscillating fields around. So, uh, so are particles not, like oscillations in the field? No, a particle is a particle. It's real. It's, it's real mass. Okay. But its oscillation in its speed is the the, the wave-like property of the of the particle. Okay, so the particles themselves oscillate. Is what you're saying, or the field That's, around it? Well, uh, the tron theory, the particles' volume and uh, radius is oscillating, but uh, Beckman is just talking about the oscillating fields being generated and the speed and the speed change. Okay. So it's a sign. It's like a you know about um, uh, full wave rectifiers. Uh, I'm not familiar. No. Well, anyway, there's a DC component that comes out, but then there's a an AC uh, 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 fluctuation around that because the uh, filtering is not uh, perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay, so you're saying basically Peter Beckman um, generates the Schrodinger equations. Um, uh, in in his way with with the ether model, is that correct? Right. With, and so, and, just and, the idea that uh, Maxwell's equations are valid, and there's a uh, a fixed reference frame uh, for a particle to move within, whereas with relativity, it's all relative. There's no right. So. Understood. So so that's where you get the. Um, um, the the frame of reference versus relativity, which has its inertial frames, is that correct? So we're saying there's a preferred re reference frame of the uh, ECI or the local ether that's at rest that the Earth moves moves around within. Mm -hmm. Okay. All righty, we're at 11.30. Um, did you want to present a, a little bit more before we have anybody who wants to make any comments or have questions? Um, I just wanted to uh, briefly talk about uh, the uh, time dilation. And it, Sue has a uh, an explanation for that that uh, does not involve... Uh, 
It's not involved relativity. Uh, whereas he just takes uh, quantum mechanics uh, equations for granted, essentially. Uh, although he uh, says that you have to take them in the context of the preferred, ref of the preferred reference frame, the ECI slash local ether. And he, create, he postulates a, uh, uh, a wave equation we call the local ether wave equation. And it shows how if you uh, include the electrostatic potential and the uh, gravitational potential in that equation, that uh, it shows A, that uh, the effective mass will increase as a particle moves with respect to the local ether at a high speed. And B, that uh, the uh, uh, frequency of a transition in the quantum state of an atom uh, changes due to this interaction with the electrostatic field. We, moving with respect to the ether essentially. So that the faster you, the clock moves, like in an orbit around it, of a GPS atomic clock, uh, the, uh, the atoms are frequency of oscillation and essentially the uh, resonant frequency of, uh, of a, a cesium gas in an atomic clock uh, lowers that it's a, a real physical effect, not just a, a result of uh, solving, of applying a, a, an equation like the, the Lorentz transform. So it's not time that's changing, it's just the frequency of the clock. It's, it's, it's like the um, uh, temperature affecting a, uh, the frequency of a clock or air pressure, or whatever, of course, no air pressure. So, so it's like... Space. Uh, it's what um, people in the MPA for many decades have been calling clock retardation. Well, it's actually, it's a change of, of it's a, a physical change to... Yeah, yeah, that's what clock retardation... The what, of, the, of the clock, well, right, so well, what, call that time dilation, I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. In fact, the reason we use the phrase clock retardation is the clock is slowing down, not time. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. What what was what, when I got you know involved with the MPA way back in the mid '90s, um, they they were they always would talk about clock retardation, meaning uh, you know a, GP, a clock on a GPS slows down in space because not because time slowing down, but because the physical clock slow down. So there is a a retarding of the clock mechanism, uh, and so that's what you're saying. Yeah, and okay. Sue in this paper. Here, a local Luther wave equation in speed dependent mass and quantum energy uh, actually derives the uh, the uh, v squared uh, velocity squared uh, formula. And then okay. he also uh, again applies the gravitational potential to this equation, incorporates it. It shows how uh, the uh, frequency of the uh, oscillations of the, of the atoms of the atomic clock uh, increase as you go to a higher altitude, uh, farther away from the surface of the uh, uh, celestial body, where the magnitude of the gravitational potential is, is, is lower. And alter, alternatively, uh, uh, the, uh, the, did I say the clock rate speeds up, the tick rate speeds up? Uh, it shows how the gravitational potential causes that physically, not then doing some space-time form of uh, general activity. 
and it ultimately, as you get closer to a ma massive body like the sun, the uh, uh, tick rate slows down. You have a gravitational red shift. The speed of light slows down. All of those effects explain uh, the uh, bending of starlight that uh, graze the sun that was uh, originally, obviously, or not obviously, but uh, that was one of the big uh, uh, predictions of Einstein's general relativity that uh, led to his fame and fortune and uh, being anointed as a physics god, essentially. It <laughs> uh, also explains the gravitational lensing that are uh, uh, bending of uh, starlight around uh, galactic clusters and galaxies. Now, I know this uh, is uh, kind of contrary to uh, Dowdy's ideas, but I don't know exactly how his ideas explain gravitational lensing of, uh, by uh, uh, galaxy clusters. Anyway, uh, that's uh, this is that's how Sue does it, and, and he explains things like the Haffel Keating experiment by this mechanism. It shows that if you consider the uh, Earth center, Earth center, the ECI frame, uh, and you fly a jet around the uh, outside of it, uh, and the uh, fly jets in, in counter propagating directions. Uh, let me uh, find it. It's quote that uh, So are you saying that you um, support the data from the Heffel Keating that there was actually a change or you, you don't? Well, he does, and I guess I do too. Okay. Because <laughs> okay. uh, he shows how it happens. Uh, the, the, uh, the clock rate slows down. There it is. Uh, because of the velocity of the uh, of the airplane of the jet, but it slows down less. In the westward direction compared to the uh, geostationary clocks, because it's based on this. The speed is uh, based on uh, the ground speed of the jet, but its actual speed with respect to the ECI is uh, is less than the geostationary clock. The geostationary clock is is also is this, a, is this ECI? Is this is ECI is again? It, uh, it's the local ether reference frame. It doesn't okay, gotcha. Okay, the earth. ether, ether. The earth okay. rotates within. Right. Okay. Um, so is is this a statement of prediction or a statement of, of matching data from that experiment? It's matching data. Here we go. Consider the atomic clock supported circumnavigating aircraft. In the experiment. According to local ether model, speed and the mass variation factor. Maybe it maybe it's more of a prediction of how this how he expects it to to behave than it is to compare to the actual experimental data. Is that right? It shows how the the, uh, the experimental data was was valid. That the total time. Uh, the total number of tick rates of the westward traveling clock uh, indicated that they were ticking faster than its geostationary clock. Here. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> <coughs> 
Okay. Um, if you want to maybe just wrap up for today in the next couple of minutes, and then we'll have people who have questions or comments. Um, and if you're in the green room, let me know. If you have any questions or comments in the um, chat, just put them down as question colon or comment colon, and I'll bring the, I'll put those on screen for him to see. Um, people in the private chat, I, I can grab those. I look at those once in a while, but um, that's usually in, in between the people in the green room. So uh, maybe just wrap it up in the next couple minutes so we'll have about 15 minutes to have questions or comments. Well, essentially, I um, really think this is a great uh, paradigm shift possibility uh, to uh, uh, the alternative to special relativity and general relativity. And uh, that even Sue admits that it's not, he hasn't uh, addressed every uh, phenomenon uh, that's out there, but that uh, the comprehensive scope of phenomena that he does address, both uh, for EM propagation and quantum mechanical type phenomena. He has a wave interpretation of the Compton, uh, the Compton effect, and uh, the list is, is like at least 30 or 40 different phenomena that he uh, uh, addresses in a series of uh, 40, uh, 20 plus papers, including. So, uh, I, you know, the best. Uh, if, if you're curious to learn more, the best uh, uh, option is to get get his book, uh, which apparently you can get a, uh, an ebook copy from a Taiwanese uh, website, uh, which I can check for, uh, to get a printed copy is a little more difficult. Yeah, well, maybe if you, is there a website people can go to? Well, uh, there's um, a paper that I wrote uh, that uh, is essentially an overview of what I've been trying to, to describe today. Of course, sure. Uh, which includes all of the papers that he wrote uh, and the abstracts of them and uh, URL direct link links to them, uh, as well okay. as uh, uh, instructions on how to access the ebook. So I think it's about. 20 bucks on PayPal. Okay. Okay. Alrighty, folks, maybe we have some people in the uh, green room who want to make any comments. If you have any questions, okay, I got a couple people, so let's get them up here. Um, James Keen, let's get you, let's get it to more like this. There you go. Hello, James, you're muted. Unmute yourself. Okay, do we hear you? Say hello. Uh, thank you, Jim, okay. for the presentation. Uh, from another Jim, me, uh, who is not an expert in, in all of these uh, ether literature and studies, could you explain at, let's say, a low level, a simple level, uh, any difference between your local ether theory and, and uh, what we hear about this uh, ether drag idea? I'll await your answer. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, uh, entrained ethers are essentially the, uh, the equivalent term is a dragged ether. It's an ether that's carried with the celestial body. Uh, so, uh, like I've been trying to explain, uh, this is an ether that's carried with the Earth. Or, uh, for the sun, there's a local ether that's it's just a different density, but it, uh, it's carried. It's carried with the uh, uh, the sun in its uh, orbit around the galaxy, and then the galaxy has its own local ether, uh, which it carries with it in its uh, motion uh, in the uh, local galactic group Virgo cluster, and uh, maybe even larger uh, cosmic uh, or, uh, organizations. So your, your, so your local ether theory is similar to the idea uh, of that one hears about 
of this uh, ether being dragged as the as the Earth rotates and so so forth. Well, as it's I was trying to to to, to, uh, to make the point uh, is that the critical difference here is that uh, it doesn't rotate with the rotation of, of a celestial body. Okay, so it's like you're, the galaxy, you're, you're, do, do you're know, not you know in the ether drag camp. Sorry. Okay. Thank mm, you. No. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Again, yeah. Again, try to try to think of uh, the gravitational potential that uh, it's just uh, gm over r for uh, m is the mass of the body and r is the uh, distance from the center of the body and how they all add up and how, how they all uh, uh, move with celestial bodies that generate them. That's the same idea for the local ether. Um, here's a comment from somebody, Akimbo Ojo. Uh, another imperfection is that light will be longitudinal wave in this mo model, but the light is a transverse wave. Um, is there something uh, that you can say about longitudinal versus transverse in this model? Well, first of all, I, I would say that let's not worry about that at this point. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, Again, relativity doesn't try to explain the nature of the physical nature of, of anything. It's just equations. Uh, at some point, we can try to define uh, the detailed properties of, of the uh, ether. But I would point out that uh, in terms of longitudinal versus transverse, yeah, of course, EM waves are transverse. And of course, a fluid by itself, without anything applied to it, uh, would not support transverse waves. But think of an LCD, liquid crystal display, in your calculator or your computer screen. The pre it's the presence of the field that alters the properties, the reflectivity, polarization of the fluid. So you don't have to have this elasticity built into the ether uh, pre-existing until the, the field passes by. It's the passing, it's the, 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 it's the application of the field at the point in space where it exists that alters the properties of the uh, ether to uh, uh, support this uh, spring spring like effect to uh, <clears throat> restore the uh, the density of the of the, of the uh, location we have lost him so um, maybe make a uh, we do let me uh, get him down here. Um, computer may have frozen up. Um, any, uh, Ian, did you have a comment or anything, or you really had a question? I can bring you up. Go ahead. Yes, I, I'd like Jim to say a few words about one aspect, um, David, uh, okay. because it, it's it's quite fascinating. And um, uh, Sue has developed this this very comprehensive theory, which I suppose ultimately is based on the sort of the Stokes concept which mm -hmm. unfortunately um, was dismissed quite early on. But the, the, the one thing I'd like um, Jim to say a few words on um, is the following. I think we've touched upon it before. Um, the the um, first uh, Michelson-Morley type experiments, you know, the, the second order type experiments, were not accurate enough to um, uh, pick up um, any variation in um, in light speed, if you like, or or, or transmission time, um, owing to the uh, rotate the, the spin of the Earth, the, the the rotation of the Earth. But I mean, as these experiments got more more sophisticated, uh, and the substitution of things like um, resin cavities for mirrors, as was touched on earlier, you would expect those to be picked up. And in fact. 
famously, as you well know, Jim, in 1979 in, in the Brie Hall, actually you referred to it briefly, experiment, uh, there was a, a signal of 17 hertz, I think it was, which couldn't be explained and actually was dismissed as spurious by the experimenters, but then was subsequently analyzed by people like Aspen. And he said that that showed up the spin of, of the earth at the position where the experiment was undertaken, which is Colorado. Now, my, my question is this, uh, I'd like you to say a few words about, about it maybe. Um, as it, since 1979 indeed, as experiments have got more and more um, accurate, and, and the precision has increased considerably. And a lot of these experiments have been undertaken ostensibly to check Lorentz invariants. And they're, they're down to 10 to the minus 20 and God knows what. And um, so my question is basically, how are these all explained away? I mean, you'd expect these to be picking up the um, effects due to the um, ether, the local ether, if you like, um, uh, not not being carried by the Earth in its um, rotation. And I think in the past you might have said, well, these are because of averaging or something like that in over periods of time. But I'd like you to explain that in a bit more detail, if possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, first of all, if you don't rotate to your interferometer, there's no hope of of uh, measuring anything, because when you talk about the uh, uh, the Earth's rot if the ether wind is due to the Earth's rotation, its uh, direction is constant, you know, due east-west. And the only way to see a difference is to, is to rotate it. And a lot of the early res resident cavity experiments uh, relative early, I mean, around 2000 to 2005, and the Kennedy Thorndike experiment were fixed in direction. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't rotate, did you know that? Well, anyway, the more recent Except ones- as far as the Earth was carrying them in the rotation. Because they were uh, basing their ether model on the, the universal ether model. So they were expecting to see a change as the Earth as the Earth rotated uh, relative to uh, its motion to against a, a universal ether, so they averaged their data that way. They didn't and this uh, two omega signal, the, twice the rotation rate of the of the uh, uh, of the interferometer. They averaged it out. Just like uh, uh, Brea and Hall did, but but Brea and Hall got a signal. I mean, whether they averaged it out or not, they got a well, signal. Their final and results they they explained it away. Out. They explained it as spurious. As yes. So what did the others do? Effect. I'm saying, did they not get similar signals? I couldn't find them I in think, some of the papers. It's, it's, it's hard to say. Um, yeah. Some of them talk about it. Even uh, the most, one of the most recent papers by Nagel uh, says that there was a signal that could could be a real signal, but he says he said it was probably just due to the uh, rotation with respect to the Earth's magnetic field causing some effect that he didn't really know about that he, they, they couldn't explain, but that it was. Uh, and they talk about maybe repeating it with better uh, magnetic shielding, but I don't know if they ever did. So that's, <clears throat> I mean, anyway, uh, as uh, Harry Ricker pointed out, uh, uh, Zafi also uh, recommended a uh, uh, Marcus and Morley experiment in orbit, uh, as well as uh, Ryan Wang and uh, Hayden and uh, several other uh, people. Uh, there was a, a paper published in 1986 in Nature uh, where two uh, physicists uh, recommended a uh, MMX in space. But since people are so convinced that relativity is 100% certainly right, uh, the experiment could never be approved by any kind of mainstream committee like NASA would have to be done 
private with private funding. Does that make sense? It, it does. Yes, I, I suggest that I think the other week maybe somebody like Elon Musk, but I don't know. <laughs> Perhaps he, he's not totally uh, uh, convinced by mainstream thinking. But well, he certainly anyway, got enough money. You're, you're not miss it. Mainstream, like he NASA. Certainly got enough money that he wouldn't miss it if uh, right. he did fund it. Right. right. Thanks very much. Okay, Jim, um, we're going to wrap it up for today. We've got two minutes before we go out of here. Um, I want to thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And um, again, uh, where can they find, people find more about um, uh, this gentleman's work and your work? Uh, is there a, a website or, or some place they can go, something they can search up easily and get there? Yeah, I um, can post the... Uh the link to my paper, which is probably the, the best, the easiest way to uh, uh, find all of his papers and, and, and access his ebook. But there's no. Uh, okay. Well, I think they can also go. They can go to. Uh, yeah, um, there should be. Yeah, I think so. But if you go to naturalphilosophy.org and you register, you can get in there. You can speak directly with James. Um, he's he's there and. Uh, often discussing things in the ether group so um, at that point you can get more information if you're interested but thank you so much for your presentation today uh, can, can you uh, yes post it in the as a comment uh, yeah we can do that um, yeah you can I think the best thing would you be able to go in there and do that and then I can actually put it in the comments uh, that would be fine when the video is once the videos uh, done I can go in there and add that to both the description and if you add it in the comments as well okay Great. Well, All I'll, right. I'll, actually, the the, um, the message I sent you uh, describing the talk has the link. Okay. That's a, okay. That's good. Um, I will check that out and, and, and see the if two, I can... uh, the two papers by Sue that are the most uh, important. I'd say to start with. Okay. So two papers from this link uh, by Sue uh, would be the. What you're saying is the most important. Let's see here if I can. Uh, there we go. Maybe I can put this here. I'm finding it on the website here. And there we go. So um, it's under ResearchGate, um, Local Ether Model and Quantum Mechanics Theory. Is that the one? That's fine. Okay, that's, that's the all one. The, all, the, all the other links in it. Okay, so I'll put that right now. I've got that. And that's in the chat on all three uh, channels, the YouTube and the uh, Facebook channel. So um, it's being sent out. We got it out there so those people watching can uh, read more about it. All right. Well, James, thank, thank you, you so much. much. All right. <laughs> All right. We talk so much. <laughs> no, no. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. So everybody can get, uh, you know, new ideas. So uh, thank you so much. All right, um, that was really very interesting because we we know lots of different ether models, but this one is uh, similar to entrained, but it's more like the gravitational model, as he said, which is the gravity field doesn't um, move or uh, rotate with a body, for instance, in a celestial body. Uh, the gravitational field is there around it and acts upon a body. He's saying that ether's density or gradient is the same thing and uh, that not only is a, 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 a medium for which light propagates, but it also will, it would be able to describe gravity. So let's take us on out. We are at two hours and we'll get out of here. As I always say, stay critical, stay thinking. I'm David D. Hilster. I'm your science therapist trying to get you to the promised land of becoming a critical thinker. 
Ciao for now.